I think that's all set to go. Hey, um, thank you very much for inviting me to be part of this. It's a real privilege and um, yeah, I hope I can stick to time. Pretty excited about all this zero waste stuff. So um, this slide, this first slide, get this pointing the right way, um, kind of, uh, or my presentation today is going to be a little bit of a info about waste and zero waste, where we're at globally with that. So there's going to be a few facts and figures. Part of it's going to be a personal story. I've been in this role with the Zero Waste Academy based at Massey, which has been a partnership with the Palmerston City Council for the last 13 years. So it's going to be a little bit of a personal narrative about that. And also I'm going to finish by just talking about um, a research model that I've, which shapes my work, my teaching philosophy and my research theory. So, and I'm going to give a couple of examples about that based on local research projects, which I think are, I've been really excited to be part of, but I also think they point uh, towards um, a future in terms of the relationship between universities and cities. And hopefully that'll be a really positive note to finish on. My world, um, I live in a kind of, the, this slide illustrates that, the nexus between, on one hand, uh, some pretty, um, hopefully this is going to work, some pretty dark and desperate and depressing facts and figures, uh, what we're doing with glo waste globally and where we're at. Um, but on the other side of it, um, I look at that waste issue through a zero waste lens. And through that I engage with a heterogeneous global community of practice called Zero Waste, which are doing some really fantastic and exciting and innovative things. And that balances out for me um, in terms of how I approach the subject. So. Uh, no, that's not it. There we go. I want to start by looking back. So this is a photo of my hometown in Masterton, which is just across the ranges. And what you see here is actually Blake Brothers composting, which I found out about by quite ex by accident. But around, I think somewhere around the 40, 1940s, between 1940s and 50s, they composted the entire municipal solid waste of the town. So they ground up everything that we would, if you can imagine, we put out in our rubbish bags or our trailers going to the transfer station, they ground all of that up and composted it. And uh, this is some research, Massey did research trials on the compost, and my mum and dad can remember buying that compost, and it was really good stuff. Um, and the only, the only downside is every once in a while you get a little shard of glass, but back in those days, those of us who, who are of a certain vintage will remember going to school and scouts and everything like that and, and running behind cars loading up trailers full of bottles and we would do bottle drives because bottles were a sought after commodity and I, right throughout my childhood any time you saw a bottle you grabbed it and you scarf it for the nearest store because that was probably either four cents or ten cents worth of lollies which was quite a lot of lollies. So glass was actually not out and about, it was gathered up and very, very effectively and all of the community groups and schools made money fundraising from doing that. So there was very little glass going into the compost. The other thing that happened in those days is that there was no plastic of course. So even the tin cans, the other form of packaging in those days, used to rust away very quickly because it wasn't plastic lined. So one of the things you've got to ask ourselves, so I'll get this right, is we have, have we existed in a zero waste economy in the past? And I think this is a, a really good indicator to say yes. And we, I think one of the challenges for us today is to ask ourselves what's different and what can we do about that? And I, I'm not a, um, a plastic antagonist, but I'm really interested in practical, cost-effective sustainability that's going to resolve some of the problems that we face. So, this is uh, a waste hierarchy. And waste hierarchy, the five R's, reduce, reuse, recycle, is kind of the universally accepted theoretical model for what we do in this space. And this has been accepted right around the world for about 40 years now. And we invest around about a trillion dollars into this theoretical model uh, every three years, based on the best data we can find in terms of what we get. So I want to ask, what, what are we getting for our money? So, in terms of this, this tells us basically what we're trying to do, but also what our priorities should and shouldn't be. Our first priority, in theory, is reducing waste. 
and then right down the bottom, our last priority is disposal. So I just want to look at the data. Now, the thing I want to point out is this is not my data. This is not greeny data. This is the World Bank data, okay? So that the World Bank is probably not renowned as being greenies, but this is what they have to say in terms of reducing waste. So our top priority, how are we going? So the World Bank data suggested that in 2002, uh, we were producing about 0.68 billion tonnes of waste a year. A decade later, we were producing 1.3 billion tonnes, and they estimate that by 2025, we'll be producing 2.2 billion tonnes of municipal solid waste per year. And this growth, this increase of waste, is to do with uh, population growth uh, and the rapid increase in consumption and the wealth mainly in the develop in developing countries and the urbanisation of, uh, of communities. A really interesting bit of research was done saying, when is peak waste going to occur? And this was done... Uh, and they, they, they said, without aggressive, and I quote here, without aggressive sustainability scenarios, global peak waste is not predicted to be until 2100. So we're a long way away from actually getting to the top of the waste mountain and starting to reduce our waste. This data will become a little bit more interesting as we go. So we're not reducing, we're not achieving our top priority. How are we doing in terms of our... Uh, bottom priority, least and last priority, but very, still very, very important. So the D-Waste Project, which is an international assemblage of waste experts, tell us that 3.5 billion, or 52% of the global population, lack the most elementary waste management services. So they're not, over half of the global population, after 40 years of trying to get this right, are not even on the bottom rung of the waste management ladder. And about four, and some other research is about 41% of the total amount of waste is currently being uh, treated through open burning, and there's a whole lot of toxicity and climate change issues around that. So uh, we are not managing yet to get halfway to the point of managing half of the humans to have basic waste disposal. How are we doing in terms of the middle? Now the World Bank tells us that uh, globally, so. Municipal solid waste is just one part of it, so the total waste we generate globally is around 3.4 to 4 billion tonnes, and we currently, after 40 years of having the, you will be aware of the global, the little recycling symbol, uh, we are currently re recycling one quarter. Another set of research has it at 19%. So this model, uh, in terms of the trillions of dollars we're spending on it, literally trillions of dollars, we're not actually doing what we think we should do, say we should do, or want to do at pretty much any part of that theoretical model. And I think that opens the door in terms of zero waste to what do we need to do differently? And perhaps we need to start doing things radically differently. This slide just captures, uh, beyond just the raw data, the elements of that failure, that failure of waste management theory and practice. And so we have, uh, there's a whole range of different dimensions to waste. One is disaster waste management. With the increase of extreme weather events, we're going to have uh, major problems with that. And we really don't have any kind of plan. And we're not doing business as usual waste management, let alone managing to deal with this. Technology trash, pharmaceutical waste, the default mechanism for the multi-billion dollar pharmaceutical waste industry to dispose of its problems is to flush it down the toilet. Uh, we have food waste as a major problem. A whole lot of new technology waste issues and global plastics. So I'm going to talk a little bit about a little bit about that. Uh, plastics going into the ocean. So uh, this is a really interesting point. Again, it's not the Greenies. This is the World Economic Forum saying this. Okay, uh, global pr plastics production is around 15 million tons in 1964. 311 million tons by 2014. Expected to double over the next 20 years. Again, 40 years after the launch of the recycling symbol, only 14% of plastic packaging is collected for recycling. 95% of plastic packaging, a value of around 80 to $120 billion a year annually, is lost from the economy in terms of just the raw material value of that. And the best research currently available says, suggests that there's around 150 million tonnes of plastic in the global oceans. And rather worryingly, that if we continue to deposit or allow our terrestrial waste issues to migrate into the ocean, into the rivers in the ocean, um, we, by 2050 there's going to be as much plastic in the ocean as fish by weight. 
Again, this is not the Greenies, this is the World Economic Forum, okay? So, and, and all of that is quite stark, you know, and quite problematic, but the thing I actually found most interesting about that was this little bit of information right here, is that that global plastics industry externalises in as much cost onto everybody, the commons, the tragedy of the commons, or the ocean, or the environment, or whatever, as its profit pool. And I think you have to ask um, the question, what would that industry be like if it was not allowed to externalise all of that cost and just sort of spray it out onto the environment? It would be obviously a very different industry because from day one it would make zero dollars. And they would have to figure out a way of doing things differently and uh, in order to carry on you know, business as usual. <coughs> so, what's this? Can I ask anyone, anyone tell me what this is? Any hands? Anyone going to venture a guess? Okay. okay, well, I would suggest to you that it is a self-portrait of Pani. And sometimes what we in New Zealand are inclined to do is to uh, kind of think these are somebody else's problems. We do that on climate change a lot. This is, we are only small players. This is not our problem. We don't really contribute to this. But this is a self-portrait of us. This is a self-portrait of us doing nothing. The self-portrait was taken here, where I go riding with, I'm not sure if you'll recognise this, I go riding with my kids along the riverbank, but a rather innocuous looking stream flowing into the Manawatu River. And those collection of waste litter escaping into the environment and eventually going into the world, world's oceans uh, came from just that section there. My son and I went up and photographed it, and my son Wilson is about to do his Palmerston North Intermediate School science project on this topic. So I hope, hope he'll be, win fame and fortune for his science project. Um, we have a lot of fun with science in our family and, and he's really excited about this. So he's going he's to collect all of that waste and see how fast it redeposits. This is going to be one of his bits of science. But he's going to use that information to calculate how much plastic is likely to be on the rest of that stream. And that's the, the whole of the stream there. I'll point out that this stream actually isn't coming out of Palmerston North, it's sort of on the outskirts of Palmerston North. I can't imagine what the streams flowing through our city look like. Um, actually I can imagine because we've done a stream cleanup. we live near a stream, and um, it was pretty interesting. So this is not somebody else's problem. Another bit of research, again, from the Glo it's called the Global Waste Management Outlook by the International Solid Waste <coughs> Association, that's what that stands for in the UNEP. So these are high profile international organisations, again very mainstream, this is not the greenies. In terms of responding to this global waste crisis, this uh, assemblage of the mainstream waste industry has set a whole bunch of goals. And one of their goals is 100, aiming to shift from 52% of the global population to 100% of the global population having collection and eliminating burning and open dumps. If they achieve that assemblage of goals, it will achieve 50% of the UN, UN's um, sustainable development goals in one hit. It will also achieve 15 to 20% of global greenhouse gas emissions in terms of reducing global greenhouse gas emissions. And those two things illustrate something really important about waste, is that waste integrates with everything we do. We tend to think of waste out over here and we kind of disassociate ourselves from it because it's a little bit icky. But waste is kind of everything and, and is critical in terms of moving ahead into, with sustainable development. The other thing that will happen if they achieve their, their goals is that um, 1.3 billion tonnes of food waste, um, if they reduce that, that has the potential to, to eliminate food poverty globally two times over. So we have enough food in the world to feed everybody pretty much uh, right from the word go. So the other thing that, that would happen if they achieve their cluster of goals is that it will create between 9 and 25 million dollars, sorry, 25 million green jobs. Now, all of that's really interesting and really exciting and quite motivating for someone like me, but the bit that's really interesting is this, is that they've also estimated that the cost of not doing what they're proposing to do, um, the cost of of doing, of not doing their, uh, achieving those goals is five to ten times the cost of us doing the right thing and achieving our waste management goals. So this stuff is economically really, really sound to the tune of um, 
five to ten times. If you're a business person and you know you can invest a dollar and you can get a dollar ten back, you're probably thinking, oh, that's not too bad. People, thousands of people do that every day at the TAB. But if you know you can invest one dollar and get five to ten dollars back, it's a pretty sound investment. So you've got to ask the question, if it's such a sound investment, why are we struggling to make progress? So how did we get to where we are today? This quote here I think is really interesting and it is citing a very influential person uh, in the post-war years, okay, where our current consumer-based economy was forged. And it was forged and deliberately constructed um, as a matter of economic and social priority. Our enormously productive economy demands that we make consumption our way of life and that we convert the buying and the use of goods into rituals that seek our spiritual satisfaction, our ego satisfaction and consumption. We need things to be consumed, burned up, worn out, replaced and discarded at an ever increasing rate. Now this quote is really interesting because it tells us how we got to where we are today, which in many cases is pretty good, apart from the fact we have this enormous environmental baggage attached to that. So when you construct something, the argument would be that you could deconstruct it or potentially you could reconstruct something else that could work better and deal with this problem. The next quote I think is quite interesting, is, uh, which explains a little bit as to why it's so hard to make progress in this space, is whilst governments exhort their citizens to protect the environment and through reduce, reuse and recycle, a huge advertising industry persuades people to increase discard and dump. And that was a uh, parliamentary commission, it was in a parliamentary commission environment for a little while ago. And this is really interesting for me, this quote is about 20 years old, so it's from the book Megatrends. It describes us as living in the parenthesis of history, an in-between time when the old ways of doing things have become too expensive, but when we've yet to fully develop new regulations, new laws, new ethics, new organisational structures, new technologies and to construct a new order. We have the technical ability to move towards a zero waste society. We need only to muster the political will to make it a reality. So I'd ask you to reflect on that first slide I showed about where we used to be 50 years ago and kind of evaluate this idea of moving towards a zero waste society to the reality of where we've come from. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about where zero waste fits in terms of the sustainability Thing. This is a, I call this a, an eco ideas market space, and there's an enormous bunch of very intelligent, hard working, committed people doing all kinds of stuff all over the place. Uh, and uh, uh, Glavick and Luckman are researchers who kind of developed this rubric of understanding. And so Zero Waste is sort of in the midst of that. This is a very busy intellectual space, a lot of investment and time and energy. People are, are not trying to fail at this, we are trying to do things. And I think it's quite interesting to kind of think about what do we all agree on. And one of the things that everybody kind of agrees on in this space, I think everybody agrees on, I haven't talked to all of them, but um, is that um, when you either through landfill or disposal, which is at the bottom of the waste hierarchy, once you get to that point, things become very, very difficult to do anything useful with waste. But what we think of as going into the waste stream must fundamentally be reconceptualised and understood as a, a stream of resources. Once you mingle them together and co-mangle them all together, it becomes very, very difficult and problematic and almost inevitable that you will go down the disposal route. But if we understand the resources flowing through our society for what they are as resources, then, uh, and this, this slide captures it really nicely, it's not waste until it's wasted. And any landfill analysis will tell you this. So, and what else do they all agree on? Well, they all agree on this idea here that our lineal economy, uh, or our economy, is basically lineal in terms of how materials flow through it. We extract stuff from the environment, we make it into ore, raw, raw materials, we manufacture it, we consume it. This happens very, very quickly. Um, we've, we've been uh, inundated with um, conditioning in terms of the throwaway society. So this part often happens very, very quickly and then all of those resources go into disposal and we have to go back over here and dig some more out. So pretty much everybody in this space agrees that what we need to do is kind of engineer this lineal economy and kind of make it bend around and become a circular economy. Okay, so that's kind of 
what everybody agrees. I think that's useful to think about because often we debate about what we should and shouldn't do, and everybody agrees on this, and you'll see this language at the Waste Management Institute conference all over the place, the idea of a circular economy. So I just want to read this out. Why, why does everyone agree on this, and why is it a good idea? So this is a, a U, US EPA um, thumbnail. Recycling prevents emissions of many greenhouse gases and water pollutants. It saves energy, supplies valuable raw materials to, to industry, creates jobs, stimulates the development of a greener, greener technologies, conserves resources, and reduces the need for new landfills and combustors. So recycling is everybody's friend, and this idea of the circular economy is everybody's friend. And the bit that I'm actually quite interested in locally, and I'm going to talk about a local project, is the reuse economy. So you can visualise that as kind of like a, a set of materials that are being reused. And our reuse economy, I think, is really interesting. I know this because I'm a parent. And as soon as you have kids, suddenly people, without even being asked, suddenly arrive with bags full of clothes. And uh, all the, my, my, my wife's friends are anticipating what our kids are going to grow into and stuff. And you have this lovely social fabric, this dynamic of sharing stuff. And clothing is done that. And so this reuse economy really interests me, and it's something that we, we've looked at locally, I'm going to talk a little bit about that. So, uh, again, what do we all agree on in this space? And this is, some, this is quite interesting from my point of view. This is a common zero waste rhetoric. Nature is a zero waste system, nature recycles everything. And you will find um, these, these writers here are well known authors around the circular economy. And they have basically the same idea. Nature operates according to a system of nutrients and metabolism where there is no such thing as waste. And the circular, or the industrial ecologists, they, they kind of see, say the same thing. One of the most important concepts of industrial ecology is that like the biological system, it rejects the concept of waste. If industrial ecology seeks to loop the technosphere back onto itself and achieve the ultimate industrial ecology goal of zero waste. Even the International Solid Waste Association, they, their vision is to work towards a world where no waste exists. So this idea of zero waste, if it sounds really extreme and often is ridiculed for being that, and certainly uh, in terms of New Zealand's political ecology has been marginalised because of that in spite of the success and the reality of that's where we've been in the history, um, actually everybody's talking about the same thing. And it's simply that our anthropogenic economy is out of sync with the laws of nature. What nature tells us, when we look at, at natural systems, they are all cyclical, and our human economy is basically lineal. So we're out of sync, and it's us that needs to change. And one of the really interesting things, I think, uh, also is in terms of zero waste, and where zero waste differentiates, differentiates itself from these other kind of intellectual tribes in terms of their thinking uh, is that zero waste provides a, the concept of a continuum of aspiration. That's really, really important because waste issues are not going to, we've had waste issues for hundreds of years and in 50 years or 100 years time we're still going to be grappling with the, the, the issues of waste. As I said, these, these issues are changing with technology. So zero waste provides us with a continuum of opportunity and as the UNEP say, there will always be need for improvement, and that once one target has been achieved, others more demanding and more difficult will still remain to be tackled. And so zero waste, in terms of this ecological idea, represents a, bit, a biodiversity. And I would say that given we are failing so badly in this space, we need all of the people trying all of the different things as, as we can get, because we don't actually know what's going to work. OK, having said that, zero waste... Um, is very, very successful and is a really creative and dynamic space. There's towns and cities and countries, there's zero waste universities with zero waste programs all around the world. Who and what is zero waste today? Well, historically, uh, zero waste was actually begun in industry. Industry is where the zero waste idea was first formed, and we're in the process globally of trying to translate that success into a municipal context. And that's a lot more challenging because in industry you control what comes in and what goes out, or what you do and then what goes out. In a city uh, you can have a zero waste policy or a zero waste strategy but ultimately you have very little control over what happens in your jurisdiction. You're an influence bearer rather than a controller. The other part of the zero waste community is the activists and that gives zero waste a kind of strategic 
prickliness, if you like. Uh, zero wasters are often the people who campaign against new incinerators or new landfills and really putting the heat on this whole the normalisation of disposal. Uh, zero waste happens all around the world in highly developed economies as well as developing economies. Uh, there's a whole lot of um, academic and strategic governance work. Uh, zero waste needs to be understood in terms of a downstream conception. I, I come from a waste, I worked at a landfill, I come from a recycling background. And, but there's a whole bunch of people that are talking about zero waste who don't have anything to do with that. They're working in the design of products and production systems and trying to achieve zero waste in that space. And they are compatible worldviews. Although, in this quote here from Robin Murray, who's a, a writer around zero waste, and um, Mr Williams, who's a professor, uh, is zero waste fundamentally provides a hyper-aspirational ideal uh, and is envisaging a complete socio-economic redesign culminating in what they call a second industrial revolution or a green industrial revolution. So zero waste is very, very ambitious and I guess the argument is that what we're doing now is not working, perhaps we need to change the level of thinking that we're approaching these problems. Zero waste is also strategically controversial uh, and there's a creative tension in terms of zero waste being formally defined versus it being uh, sort of shorthand for innovation. So that's a little bit of theory for you. Again, zero waste is uh, what I would call an innovation space. Um, it's part of a creative area where when you set this high aspiration, it actually challenges you to think really differently and radically. And there's a whole lot of really interesting things going on in the zero waste space. One of them is actually personal lifestyle. I'm going to talk a little bit about New Zealand's politics. Um, but fundamentally we don't need to wait for government to do things. There's a whole bunch of people who've shown that when they have tried to achieve a zero waste lifestyle, they've reduced the waste that they generate personally through the way they think, the way they buy, what they consume, from an average of 750 kgs per year down to 7.5, I think. So a hundredfold reduction simply by making personal choices. So we don't have to wait for government to get on board with this. Uh, although I think we could do a lot if government would get on board with some of these ideas. Um, so I talked about zero waste starting in an industrial context. Now, I'm not sure, but where I come from, you can't get more successful than 100% achievement of your goal. So these are international com companies that pioneered the concept of zero waste. And so zero waste is incredibly successful in an industrial context. And no one is running around with a big green stick beating these guys to make them do it. They're doing it because it's good for their business. So when people say to you that environmentalism is a cost or a burden on the economy, tell them it's nonsense, because it is nonsense. It's possibly true if you do it badly, but actually I mix with a lot of environmentalists. I've never heard anybody say we want to strangle the economy and cause a whole lot of problems to business and stuff like that. And this is the, the, the genesis of zero waste happened in, in this space. And as I said, we're just in the context of translating that into a municipal setting where you go, it becomes exponentially more complex. But that's part of the human uh, transition. But even in spite of those problems and challenges, zero waste still rates amongst um, the most successful. So the, this is a trans trash and urban America report r r rated 37 cities. Uh, and I, I have to say American cities are probably not the most um, environmentally conscious spaces to be, but five out of five cities in the top two ranking brackets were zero waste cities. And only three recently committed zero waste cities were in the bottom two ranking brackets of 20 cities. So would I say that zero waste correlates with success? No, but there are indicators to suggest that it does. Uh, this is a slide, a screenshot of zero waste um, San Francisco. So San Francisco leads one of the leaders in the world globally in terms of dealing with waste. So they're at past their 75% oh, sorry, 75 diversion rate and now heading into the 80s. Uh, that's interesting from a Palms North point of view because our waste minimisation management plan is targeting 75% diversion. It's really interesting. Uh, these guys and another guy, Vaughan Levitsky from Zero Waste South Australia, again a zero waste hotspot, they lead the world in terms of achieving waste diversion goals, came to New Zealand, borrowed New Zealand's waste strategy from 2002, went back and implemented it, and I was, had the privilege of being at a Waste Management Institute conference when these guys came back and said, we borrowed your strategy, 
we implemented it, now we lead the world, what the hell happened to you guys? Um, so I think we've got to ask some tough questions of ourselves in New Zealand. And this is again uh, a, a case study out of Zero Waste Europe, uh, again where they've managed to reduce waste, again okay, there's a very problematic issue of reducing our waste, they've reduced it by 39% and they've increased their um, recycling by 82%. So zero, and this is a small Italian town with a whole community engaged in that. Can I? Philip, what are the years at the bottom? We can't see the years on that graph. Yeah, I'm sorry, I can't, um, I can't change that. But it's 2004, 2004 to 2013, I think. Okay, so um, five minutes. Okay, oh goodness. Um, okay, I think I might scoot towards the end of my presentation, and so we might just move through. I wanted to talk a little bit about product stewardship. And I won't do that, and I won't do the politics bit. I'll do the story about Palmerston North and Zero Waste Academy. Okay, so my role has been uh, with Zero Waste Academy, and that's been a partnership with our city. And I think that's really interesting in terms of what we've achieved. My role involves a bit of teaching, a bit of research. I'll just catch up with my notes. And so I just want to reflect on that because um, that's quite interesting in terms of globally, in terms of how you might want to address things. So in particular, as I said, my research has been framed around this idea, this idea of living labs. So I'm going to talk about two research projects that um, we have done, oh, sorry, uh, this is a, a bit of work that we did with the city in terms of, uh, so Tristia is going to talk about polystyrene a little bit later on. Uh, in terms of the product stewardship council, so that gives me a, my role gives me an opportunity to be out and to advocate and to be involved in, in change. Um, I've had a lot of involvement. I wanted to share a little bit about this in terms of going way back to um, in 2007. We did a zero waste study tour. We, we went right around New Zealand looking at the best community enterprise models and um, worked with the Green Hub. And we did a whole lot of research work with architects in online in New York and Mexico who donated their time to our project and we developed this idea for a community enterprise uh, resource recovery centre for our city because there's some fantastic resource recovery centres uh, which employ lots of people, do great stuff, they're financially sustainable and we started with the question why haven't we got something like this in our city. We designed it, we looked at it and these things tend to involve, can be involved community gardens and arts and technology and a whole bunch of stuff. So put the petition to the council, uh, it was the most signed petition in terms of anything, in terms of going into uh, waste policy, um, but unfortunately we didn't realise our goal. So there's a few kind of dreams I guess out there in terms of, um, that haven't been realised in, in terms of my time frame with the council and working with the council. So this is about uh, these projects and this idea of living labs. And I'm particularly interested because data in this area is very, very poor in the idea of industrial ecology and the toolkit that you can use to try and improve uh, data in this space. So one of the things we did, um, it was a Palmerston City Council project. My role was to facilitate and to enable and to support um, this project that looked used uh, the idea of material flow analysis, which is an industrial ecology um, research tool, in particular social material flow analysis, to look at what was happening or hadn't been recorded in our waste assessment, which is this, this something that the city's required to do under the Waste Minimisation Act. And this is really important because 40%, the council only controls 40% of the material a waste flow in the city, 60% is controlled by private enterprise and therefore we need to understand what's happening outside of this, the city's control. And I was particularly interested in the reuse flow in terms of what was happening there um, and it relates I guess to the achievement of the council's goal. So um, this is what we did and this is what we found <coughs> in terms of analysing what we called the 3R sector. So this is information that was not captured in our waste assessment but is out there and is a sector doing work for the City Council, if you like, contributing to the waste management plan, but doing it for free. So that sector, which involves the groups like the Salvation Army and um, Presbyterian Support and Hospice and Zilch and others, uh, are turning over $28 million, a projected turnover. We sampled as many as we could our 
our, um, our participation rate was about 75%, so it was pretty robust. That enabled us to kind of project from the sample through to what we think the total sector looked like. So the, re the, the second hand sector and the collaborative economy is really quite significant locally in terms of contributing. Um, we're able to translate the full and part time and volunteer work into an effective full time job figure and estimate the, the amount of tonnage of materials that weren't captured in the waste assessment, which is pretty significant relative to around 20,000 tonnes is what we do with general recycling and about 19 through the composting operation. So this enabled us to capture some data that wasn't there and also because we use sort of a social or a sort of integrated social analysis along with that and that's important because you don't just want to know where resources are going, you want to know why they go certain places. Um, and we discovered a whole lot of things about the sector that, are, uh, that they have a bunch of issues and challenges. Um, and that there are a whole lot of opportunities in terms of the city to be able to facilitate the sector in doing all of this free work for all of us. The other thing which was really interesting was that we discovered that apart from just the straight empirical work in terms of tonnages diverted or held into this reuse loop, um, this sector does a whole, you can translate that in terms of uh, through life cycle analysis, you can translate that to uh, contribution towards the sustainable city strategy but also, what do these people do with the money that they earn? Well, they fund uh, drug and alcohol rehab, homeless shelters, low income support, family counselling, hospice, youth at risk, emergency aid, sustainable transport, and a whole bunch of other stuff. So we have a sector in our local economy, the community enterprise sector, which is doing a whole lot of recycling work that we didn't really know about, we kind of knew about, and um, when they earn a bit of money from doing it, they invest it back into our community. So for me, this was really encouraging in terms of understanding that sector and really, I guess, opened my eyes and hopefully opened the council's eyes in terms of trying to create a positive rapport with that sector because they do so much work for us for free. Um, just in, in real terms, this graphic here just is what's factored into our, um, uh, or is an illustration of our, our current waste assessment, how much goes to recycling and the splits in terms of private and public sector. So um, this, I guess, one of the things that was really interesting was that if you follow the Ministry of the Environment's waste assessment guidelines, you miss out on all of this information. And this information is at the top of the waste hierarchy. Uh, so in theory, it should be our highest priority. But if you follow the waste assessment guidelines, you're not going to capture that data. So I guess as a researcher, that was really interesting for me. And um, in terms of achieving um, zero waste or doing something about this, this is about, there's about 40,000 tonnes of waste going to landfill in that previous slide. There's about 44,000 tonnes. If you want to do something about that, if we're serious about diverting that and achieving our goal of 75% waste diversion, you have to really get in amongst this stuff, treat it as resources and then figure out uh, financially sustainable ways of extracting it and doing something um, useful with that. And I think research, and in terms of the partnership between Massey and the city, we can do something about that. So what do we need? We need to understand who's doing what, when and how, and what we can do differently. We need to understand what best practices look like and what appropriate technologies for all of these different material types. And we need to look at the costs and benefits and infrastructure and the social and regulatory interventions and incentives. And all of that needs to be financially sustainable. Nobody wants the council to go broke or lose money and it has to be integrated and um, holistic and market-based and socially grounded. And I've had the opportunity. So this is my last little, I'll just fly through this. Uh, this is another project that we've just done um, in collaboration with the City Council. And this is the um, same Living Labs idea, partnership between the city and the university uh, about resolving practical waste problems. Now there's a whole bunch of stuff that's sold in the city is biodegradable. You probably buy, choose to buy your biodegradable coffee cups if you're ethically motivated, but the question is actually do they get composted? And most of them don't, uh, currently anyway, because our composting operation just treats it as contamination. So what we've done is structured a research project using the guys that run the composting operation to try and um, help them understand does this stuff compost in a composting operation or not. And it was a whole lot of fun actually, and I won't say where these materials came from, but there's a whole lot of organic recycling projects that are around the place where notionally it's 
collected for recycling, but in reality it just goes straight to the landfill. So it's a bit of a scam and, and a failure, I guess, of our, recy our recycling ethic and our, um, and our social contract, really, I guess, if your people are going to make the effort to put it in one bin versus another. So this project was very practical, it was really interesting, it was a lot of fun actually. And these are the composting guys um, making up the little sachets of, of all of these different biodegradable types. So we gathered everything that's for sale that we could find in the city to test its biodegradability. Uh, this just illustrates, instead of it being done in a lab, it was actually done in the composting operation. And you can see us doing our thing. And so it's a really good example of sort of an action research approach, working with the people who have the power to solve the problem and working in a way that enables them to kind of become empowered through the knowledge. And um, yeah, we had a whole lot of fun and there's a whole lot of really interesting things that come around out of that in terms of where to from here, in terms of future research ideas. And I've got a student at the moment, she's from Africa. Sorry, it's just slipped my mind. But she's going to be doing some of this next stage in terms of quantifying home composting. Because again, that's something that's not captured in the waste assessment, and yet it's, uh, it's part of what we do as everyday life. So I'm sorry I've gone over time a little bit. Um, I did practice my <laughs> presentation beforehand, but um, I hope I haven't covered anyone else's time. But thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um, <laughs>